All right, guys, let's go ahead and pray. And we'll so, Father, we just want to honor you tonight. I just bless your name. Would you draw near to each person? Reveal yourself to us. We've come to learn from you. I ask that you would establish your lordship in the midst of us. And I this evening, and I thank you in advance. In the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, we've been working through the basics of prayer. Uh, I've been trying to give you some, I think last month, if you guys are going to have to help me, but I believe I taught you on the stages of waiting on the Lord. Okay, so now we're moving into what we call the basic, what we call the theology of prayer, how the Bible talks about prayer. And now what we're going to do is we're going to move into some practical ways that prayer is effective for you and you can use it in your life and you can help other people when you pray for them. So we're going to learn how to do what we call personal ministry in prayer. So for the next couple months, we're going to be learning about deliverance, healing, physical healing, <clears throat> spiritual healing, and emotional healing, and how to pray for people so that it actually is effective. Okay? So we're into how to minister to people in prayer. So um, as we talk about that, remember, uh, I, I'm just going to give us a real quick circle here. I've said that if you look at prayer, you have this there's a portion of scripture that talks about what we call, we put it as devotional prayer. This is where we learn to get closer to the Lord and get to know Him and relate to Him. And so you would have things like uh, hearing from God or uh, silence and solitude, those kind of things. Those are a certain type of prayer that are taught in scripture to get to know the Lord. Then there's another type of prayer that I would call advancing prayer. And this is when we walk with God and he advances his kingdom through us in prayer. So we learn how prayer changes things in our everyday life. How You guys realize that the Bible tells you to pray for everything that's going on in your life. Your finances, your problems, your stress, uh, the breakthrough. All those things the Bible talks to you about advancing the kingdom through prayer. And interesting enough, depending on... Uh, what group you hang out with in the body of Christ, now not everybody does this, but I find that there are just certain sections of the body of Christ that spend more time talking about devotional prayer and very little about advancing the kingdom through prayer. And then there are some groups that teach on advancing the kingdom and they don't spend a lot of time teaching. So they'll tell you how to go out and uh, rule and reign in prayer, but they don't tell you how to get close to the Lord. I actually want to balance both of those, okay? And so we're, our goal this point on is we're, we're taking this topic and we're saying, well, let's develop it. How do we actually advance the kingdom? What we're going to do is we're going to work on the idea of deliverance. All right. And our, my reference point to start with is Ephesians chapter 6 and why Paul talks to us about this. So if you guys do now have your Bibles, let's go ahead and look at Ephesians chapter 6. And it says this, finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. So God wants you, as we go through everything we're going to talk about, God wants you to be strong with his might, right? So put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. So the devil actually has a scheme, uh, which you guys all, if you're like me, I never pick up on it until I'm in the middle of it and almost totally defeated because I don't ever sit around thinking about it. It's just like, what is going on in my world? All right. But he says this, um, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers. So, that's rulers. Uh, it's against um, powers. And it's against world forces uh, world forces of this of this darkness so it points to darkness as world forces okay so as I um, trying to think. I actually have a whole entire course on spiritual warfare and deliverance. I mean, I actually teach like 27 courses on this stuff. And so 
not to give you too much information, but to kind of start the journey with this. When it gets into Ephesians 6, what it does is it begins to explain it would be like this. We have this whole thing going on in the heavenlies. And it says that you're warring against that, and, it's, and you have to learn how to deal with that. And then you also have to deal with it on the earthly level. Now, if I use this term, I'm going to see if you guys have ever heard this. How many of you have ever heard the term worldview? So you have a worldview. If you've never analyzed it, you have a worldview. And the worldview usually is formed by the culture you were raised in. Okay? So if you have any of you ever gone outside of what we would call the United States or Canada or Europe and listen to how people like in South America or Africa or Asia talk about the way they see the world. Those, now they're not right or wrong, it's just they have a different worldview. Usually, I found this amazing, even when I was in Mexico, they always talk about the spiritual first and how it affects the natural. In our culture, we talk about the natural first and struggle even understanding if there's a spiritual. Now, not one's right and the other is wrong. It just shows different cultures have worldview. Paul is now going to have a discussion with you, and he's going to tell you the correct way that you should look at the world. All right? And he says, your struggle is not with flesh and blood. So he's now saying, well, your struggle, you need to understand that the struggles that you're having in life with evil, you're dealing with a, a specific person. All right, so without getting into demonology and all this other stuff, Satan thinks that he should have control over everything, and then he has a group of fallen angels called demons that he directs to do things. Okay, so your struggle is with him and his minion, not people. Why, why does the Bible point to that? Because I don't know if you ever watch evil people. Don't you want to take a two by four and hit them in the head? And so because we can't look past the natural most of the time and think what's causing that person to be evil, we think if I take out that person, evil will stop. Well, the Bible's trying to point to it. First, stop fighting in the wrong realm. And two, stop assuming if that person goes down, evil's over. Because it, it, the enemy is a spiritual being, and he just moves from one evil person to another to keep trying to do what he wants to do. Do you guys get that? So the Bible is now trying to focus your attention here in Ephesians, and it's telling you this. Your struggle is with him. And so now moving forward, when we talk about the idea of spiritual warfare and deliverance, you have to learn how to defeat him and demons. They're your struggle. If you learn how your authority works against them, this stuff is fun. If you don't learn how to deal with this, you're going to be upset about this all the time. Okay? So, he says that there are rulers. Rulers what? There are rulers in the heavenly, and there's rulers on the earth. That, and you've got to remember that, the Bible look, it gives that division. Don't assume he's just talking about people. There are rulers in the heavenly. There are demons, they even point to this in a Daniel, that rule certain regions. Uh, are you aware of this? If, and when I'm saying this, you guys have heard this, right? Has someone not heard this? You guys all with me on this so far? <laughs> okay. So here's a question. Why does a certain form of a false religion flourish in a certain geographical location on the planet? But it doesn't flourish in another place. You guys ever considered that? So why does Buddhism or those kind of things flourish in, the, in Asia, but have a real hard time in the Middle East or in Russia or South America? Why doesn't Buddhism have an effectiveness in those regions? Because a certain demon power manifests his own rulership in that region, and that's the false religion he's trying to get the masses caught into. Same thing with Islam, same thing with uh, all the occultism in Russia. I mean, just you're seeing their personality and how demons manifest in certain regions. And Paul is saying, hey, kind of pay attention to this. They, they do this stuff, 
And the Bible is saying, now think about this, the Bible is saying you have to learn, you actually have authority over them, and you have to learn to break their influence and their power so that the gospel can come forth in a nation. Go ahead. Do these rulers have specific names? Well, the Bible points to some of them having names, but I don't know if you're... It, uh, so I'm always going back and forth. I don't know if you need to know their names specifically. I think the Lord just needs to tell you how to deal with it. Okay. So, But I might change my mind three weeks from now after seeing more on it and say, hey, that, I don't know about that. Um, because you do see Jesus saying, hey, you need to address this certain, and he'll name spirits and demons, but he's doing deliverance on the natural level with them. All right, so there are heavenly rulers. There's earthly rulers. Okay. So how can we have nations right now where rulers can do the wicked type of things that they're doing? I mean, killing people and not caring for human life and manipulating people and moving in the power of which. How, how come this is all going on? Because they, they are affected by demons or Satan himself to be this way. Okay, It's not just they're fallen. The Bible points to the fact that it tells us that people that do this stuff are empowered by Satan and demons. So, does it bless you guys to realize that Jesus has actually given you authority to cut off their power, bind them from doing what they're doing so that they can stop oppressing people? Amen. Okay, one of you enjoyed that. Great, let's move on. Now it uses, so this, these, this concept, one of these categories here, powers. There are powers in the heavenlies and powers on the earth that the enemy uses to display darkness, okay? When we say powers, we could actually mean motivating someone to do in the, something in the power of their flesh or motivated by a demonic power. One's heavenly, one is, uh, is the enemy causing them to come into agreement with something. By the way, if you didn't know this theologically, God can't do whatever he wants indiscriminately on the planet, and Satan can't do whatever he wants indiscriminately on the planet. They have to get man to come into agreement with him. So anything that God wants to do, he has to get someone to agree with him on this planet. The devil can't just do whatever he wants. He has to get someone on the planet to agree with him. Is that why they say God is not in control? Yeah. So the way that you would work through that is we find out that God is the owner of everything. The, that Bible says that. God owns everything. So God owns all. I mean, he's created. He owns all this stuff. The control of it was turned over to man. And then Adam and Eve turned it over to Satan and said, you're in control now. But he still can't do it because man was put as the only legal authority on the planet the, the spiritual realm cannot just do whatever it wants indiscriminately. It has to have a person come into agreement with it. That's what it means. It's, it's, it doesn't matter if the devil is evil. He still has to follow the legal bounds of how God has created everything on this planet, even though he's in rebellion to the Lord. All right, so <clears throat> there are rulers, there are powers, and then it says world forces of darkness. So now it's saying, hey, you're watching all this stuff go on in the world. Don't interpret it as political parties or false religions, take it to the source. What is causing world forces of darkness to do the wicked things they do? They're energized by Satan demons to do those things. Now the Bible, the reason why I'm going over this before we start on the basic deliverance is the Bible is trying to tell you God has given you what you need at two levels. One uh, level is called protection. And that's where we get the armor of God described to us. I believe there are six, six armors. Five of them are protective, one is offensive. Helmet, breastplate, belt, shoes, sword, four, five. So I was wrong. It's, no, oh, shield. Okay, so I was right. So, um, five of them are to protect you one of them is offensive so you have protection that God has given you and then God has given you what's called offensive or attack weapons most of the time 
Uh, if you guys are like I am, I'm always just trying to figure out how to protect myself and then stay out of the fight. I, I, isn't it funny? The Bible is straightforward to tell you this is what's actually going on in the world. But because I want to live on a beach and my whole uh, view of life is to be in the Bahamas and to relax all the time, I don't mind I have to protect myself every day, but the idea that I have to actually use an attack weapon and go after the enemy took me years to figure that out. So you guys ready? You either get up and go after him or he's going to get up and go after you. And I, I, let me say it the best way I know. It's very simple. It's more fun to take down his kingdom than to spend all your time trying to protect yourself. <laughs> I think. Let's see if we can figure that out. Okay. Do you guys have any questions? Because we're going to now move on to deliverance. I'm going to talk to you about how to protect yourself now. Go ahead. So, so being more offensive than defensive. You're going to learn how to. So by being offensive, you actually learn how to protect yourself. Okay. It's, 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 ben, I don't know if I should ask you this. Have you ever done karate or martial arts? or anything? Okay. You realize the goal isn't to just sit there and block all day. Right. You have to knock them down or this is never going to end. Okay, so you actually learn how to protect yourself by being really good at offense than to sit around just, oh, I'm going to block that, and I'm going to, oh, I, I can duck that one and all that. I mean, that gets exhausting after a while. Yeah. Isn't that a movie quote, the best defense is a good offense? If it is, they stole it from the Lord. I don't know. <laughs> uh, okay, it, it probably is. I'm sure someone said that, but that's actually a biblical concept here. You, you really, if you understand, and it's funny, the guy that taught me deliverance used to love taking people through personal deliverance. He just thought, what a blessing. Now, I've actually done this. I've actually driven, seriously, uh, I can actually tell who it is now because they've passed away, but um, I, I've been blessed enough to actually drive uh, one person. I went through this season doing deliverance exclusively for a couple months when it first came to the Lord, which was weird. But I got to drive like 13 demons out one person, and I mean, they were manifesting, changing the voice, picking people up off the ground, throwing them across the room, changing the temperature in the room. I mean, just all this stuff you see in all these horror movies, and you think, well, I don't know if that's real. I mean, that they get it from somewhere. The enemy actually does do all that kind of stuff. And it was amazing to watch how demons were afraid of me. Because, you know, the way they present them falsely in any type of media is they always overtake Christians almost immediately. But in reality, they begged me not to de be delivered. They, they tried to, de can you imagine a demon trying to make a deal with me <laughs> that they didn't want to be delivered, crying through the person. I mean, just all, and then threatening to kill me and all this other stuff. I mean, it was just amazing. And I didn't even know my authority. And having to take that person through that process, I learned my authority and I went, oh. This is why Jesus said none of the, the power of the enemy will hurt you. They don't want you to ever figure out what they're doing. They don't ever want you to figure out your authority because they lose when you know who you are. They lose. They have no authority over you. So do you guys see why it's better to learn how to protect yourself but to go out? It's more fun to go after what they're doing. It really is. Now, as I'm saying this to you, I want you to think about something. Anytime we come to this topic... People think, well, don't talk about that. You're not focusing on the Lord. Our goal isn't to worry about it. But you have to know this stuff at some point, and then you can forget it all and go back to worshiping the Lord. But when you get into a problem, you know how to, how to actually deal with it. Okay? That's why we're doing this. And trust me, I, I told you I have a course where I cover it. I get tired of talking about them, but so many Christians are just allowing demons to beat up on a morning and night and never deal with it. And, and they're just like, how am I victorious in Christ? Well, you're Victorious because of all the things that Jesus has given you to be victorious, but you've got to use them. You can't just sit around, well, you know, darn, I just got stolen from again. All right, so do you guys have questions so far? Just basic. I'm going to go into the protective mode. How do you actually protect yourself first? Yeah. The back row. Go for it, Liz. So like what would be an example of that? Uh, Marxism. It's a doctrine of demons. It gets people to worship demons, and then they have an ideology and a worldview that come out of it that let's set everything on fire, that kind of stuff. Yeah, even though it's working through people. Okay. Yeah. So, like, powers, I told you, is heavenly and earthly. This is driving out demons. 
But forces, you have to think of more than one person. These are like movements of something. So evil movements. So I don't know if you guys know, since we've uh, gone through, um, it's kind of amazing. We've gone through Hong Kong Fluey and we've shut down the media industry, right? Hollywood is producing nothing. You're aware of that, right? Mm -hmm. Think of how much evil has not been put through that group in the last six months. The, the nations have got a reprieve from all the filth that comes from that world forces of media. And it's filth. I, I, I was almost going to say something positive about Hallmark, but they're filth now. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Uh, go to uh, Pure Flix, and then you'll be happy. All right. Any other questions? Because we still need to get to the protective part. Jesus says you need to know about this. Paul talks about this. And by the way, uh, as someone that God has been kind enough to let me travel around the body of Christ, I'm going to tell you something that I've learned by firsthand experience, not just what I read in Scripture. I spend more, more time at having to attack what the enemy is doing over people's lives. That's the main thing I deal with where I go, is what the enemy is doing to people. Because he's, he's just trying to beat up on Christians constantly. It's amazing because we don't know our identity and our authority, how much Christians put up with from the devil and demons. I mean, they're just shocking. All right. I think I've, I've stated we need to get on with the teaching. But the Bible is going to point to the fact that this is what you're dealing with. Okay? Well, which is weird if you think about it. I mean, you know what? The Bible doesn't cover it every week, but you've got to teach people sometimes about it. So God has to get me on a plane, and I have to sit around and wear a mask and then throw food at me and stuff like that so I can come here and say, guys, we actually need to learn this stuff. Isn't that amazing? We're thankful. Yeah, I'm, I'm thankful I get to do it too. I'm having fun with you guys. Okay. All right, so let's, let's work on the basics. Here's what Jesus says about Satan and him in regard to him. All right, so when he's uh, having his last supper, he, he says that the enemy, he's talking about Jesus Scar, he's going to go out, but he has nothing in him. So do you remember Jesus says, he has nothing in me. The Greek word for he has nothing in me means the idea he has nothing that he can snag inside my soul to get entrance into my life. So Jesus actually taught, excuse me, the disciples how to protect themselves. Okay, so you need to know how to protect yourself. How do you protect yourself? It's probably stuff you're already doing now because anything that we would say, here's a positive way to know the Lord without even being taught this, you're being taught how to protect yourself. Okay, so what we would say, well, when we talk about deliverance, and by the way, I'm, I'm sure a lot of you, because of the effect of Bethel's ministry, you know, deliverance means sozo. And so that's the word we get for salvation. It's the word we get for healing. It's the word we have for deliverance. That's not the only word for those words, but the word sozo covers those three things. So anytime someone's healed, they've been delivered. Every time someone has been brought to salvation, they've been delivered. Do you guys get it? Every time someone's been delivered, they've been healed, and they've brought, been brought to salvation. So the interconnecting, those three words can be used in any passage where sozo is being used because that's what's happening. God isn't just bringing you to salvation. He isn't just healing you, and he isn't doing deliverance. He's doing all three at the same time. All right. So. Doo -doo -doo. Oh, cool. I was on my right page of notes, and then I just lost Oh, there it is. I lost it. Okay, here we go. So. The, the first shield that, or the first piece of armor that the scripture talks about that you need to do, and I usually um, teach on the armor of God. I might pick that up in a month or two. But it talks about um, the first thing that you need to have in your own life to protect yourself is salvation. So the presence of God protects. Uh, this, is, this is what I learned when I started doing deliverance. They recognize the Holy Spirit's living inside of you, and they're terrified of the Lord. They are terrified of the Lord. God's presence, you being saved, you, the Bible describes it as you've been sealed. 
And so whether now you, this isn't based on how you feel about stuff. Since you've been sealed, the idea of being sealed means there's been a stamp put on you, and the stamp is the presence of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the Lord. Well, that's one of the main protections you have in your life. It's not something you have to do. It's just something it is. This is given to you as a protection. Now, do you remember when Jesus was talking about deliverance? And he said, you know, when a demon's driven out, they go into arid places, and then they find seven more wicked than themselves, and then they come back, and it's worse. And he says, the house wasn't filled. Well, what fills the house? He's talking about the soul of men, the presence of the Lord. So not only when you get saved does God's presence come, but anywhere where you deliver somebody or heal somebody, it's like you're opening another room for the Lord to fill that, and that protects you from demons coming in and then doing damage. Okay, now I want you guys to think about this. This is something that God has given you as a form of protection. And then it uses one of the armors, and it talks about the helmet helmet of salvation, right? Okay, so don't, don't assume there's this invisible helmet that you put on your head every day, okay? What is the helmet of salvation? Do you want to take a shot at that? Um. Your mind. Okay. You're, yeah, that's right. You're right. So what does it protect? What does the helmet protect? The mind. So not only do you have the presence of the Lord, the Bible uses the idea that where are most spiritual warfares coming to? Your thoughts. So you have, now, it says the helmet of salvation. So the helmet of salvation means you have to get, isn't this funny? I'm going to actually say this to you guys now. You have to get down in your thoughts what it means to be saved. Because the first line of attack is to try to steal salvation and challenge your identity. The enemy is going to try to come and convince you God is not for you. He saved you. And he's going to start all this junk about you not being saved for a season until you get how, uh, your mind right on your say. By the way, if you ever watch Christians, it's kind of funny. We get in rooms and we argue about, are you saved or are you not saved? <laughs> and we have all these books written on it, all this discussion. I, once God saves you, it's his desire to let you have an assurance so that your, he, your mind is not just decimated with depression all the time, that you somehow can lose this thing. You're not going to lose it. If Jesus is in the middle of this with you, <laughs> go ahead. Even if you're not walking with the Lord, like this is funny. I'm glad you did that to me. <laughs> yeah, without having to d explain all of salvation to you, I'll put it to you this way. So, of life, salvation is a, this is why we have to get our helmet of salvation straightened out. It is a legal contract you make with God. It's not about how you perform. It's about an encounter you had, Jesus taking your place eternally, and God declaring you right in his sight. If it, if, because if it's about perfect performance, and please don't go down this road. Some people do this. They say, well, that person that says they know the Lord, they do all this stuff, and I don't, so I don't know if they're going to make it to heaven. Well, what you've done is you've taken the law, and you said, I'm better at the law than you are, so I've judged your salvation. Remember the whole idea of Jesus dying on the cross was to get rid of the law and the standard of the law and make it a relationship. Once you come into that relationship, it's going on, what's going on is between you and him in that relationship, not how good you followed the five, the ten laws today. By the way, just to discourage you or encourage you, you are breaking the law every day. Okay, so you don't want to go back to this. And, and by, the, by the way, the enemy can come to you every day and just point out how you've, you fail God every day. So it can't be by the law. It has to be by God declaring you, I've saved you. You're righteous. You're, forever, I'm not going to hold this against you. Is that, is that okay so far? Yes. Oh, no, I'm happy with that. Oh, were you going to ask a question? Okay, so, guys ready? 
you have the presence of the Lord, you've been sealed, and now you have to start, th now this is why I make this statement all the time, you have to begin to start thinking God's thoughts after him. Because the enemy is going to hit you. Now, flaming arrows, think about this. Do you guys realize that when a thought comes into your mind, you have to learn how to discern the source of that thought. And why the Bible describes the, arrow, the enemy throwing a flaming arrow is lies, when, when they touch your soul, feel like they're true. That's why every, most people live their life based on their emotion. When they lie because they feel it, they think it's true. The Bible tries to get you to stop using your feeling as the form of discernment. All right, so just because I've been lied to and I feel the lie and it scares me doesn't mean it's true. I can't go by how my feelings are. Whoops, feelings. I have to go by truth. How many of you have ever had spiritual warfare where the enemy is trying to convince you of a lie and you're, you're almost desperate and, and like, well, <laughs> but it doesn't feel like it's true. And yet you have to begin to fight it with truth. Uh, I spend more time, uh, you, I know you guys will find this funny, but I spend more time having to tell the devil the scriptures because he's always trying to lie to me about something. I mean, you guys deal with this, right? I mean, uh, I'll just use the current example. How many of you, as we've been going through this, think there's no hope for the future and you have to remind the devil, hey, you know, I'm sorry, but all things work together for me. I have to remind him every day, hey, God's for me. So who's going to be against me? I don't care what's going on on the planet. That's true, no, regardless of how I feel about it or what the enemy thinks about that. Does that make sense to you guys? Okay. And if you've, lit, if you've walked with the Lord for more than a month, you realize, well, that's true. Uh, what everyone, oh, the world's going to come to the end. Well, if you don't know Jesus, I guess you could look at the world that way. But you've been called to an eternal kingdom, and even, let's say you get tonight, they decide, hey, let's go around just killing Christians. You still win. It's over. You're done. You don't have to deal with all this nonsense anymore. All right. But as long as you're here, let's learn how to beat up on the enemy. Okay. The next thing, you guys ready? This is number two, how you have uh, basic protection for yourself is you learn to humble... <laughs> yourself. John, I, I haven't actually got to ask you because for months I wasn't even here and then I've decided to quit picking on you all the time but because it's your anniversary last night, which congratulations, um, what, is, what does the word humble mean? How, how do I, what does the word humble mean? I think it's the way in which uh, God sees you and you come in kind of agreement to what he says about you. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. So did you guys hear that? Mm -hmm. To humble yourself, it actually means this. It's kind of funny. It actually means acknowledging that God is God and you're a creature. And so that means that there are certain things that only God can do that you can't. And you have to learn to let God do those things in your life and be happy with that. So that would be things like, um, there's, in Galatians 5.21, it talks about the works of the flesh. And then Galatians 5.22, it talks about the fruit of the Spirit. One of the terms that's used for the power of the flesh, you'll find this fascinating, is the word witchcraft. Now, this isn't, Chanting demons and trying to put spells. This is a form of, this is how the enemy works. That's why they use the word witchcraft. It's where you take the place of God and you use your money, your verbiage, and your thought process to manipulate people to do something. It's a form of rebellion. Now remember, rebellion is as witchcraft. So it's not energized by a demon per se, it's your own energy being rebellious and you're trying to now take the place that only God can do something and you're trying to force it. Now, <clears throat> you could tell, it's not fun to say this to a group of Christians, but you can be a Christian functioning in witchcraft and not talking to demons or casting spells on people but function because it's one of the things of the flesh. Anytime you step out 
letting God lead you and you take over in a situation, you've stepped into a form of witchcraft. Isn't that amazing? I don't know if that blesses you guys. Witchcraft, uh, by the way, the, the Hebrew word for witchcraft, uh, the idea of a witch is someone really does connect with demons, but the word craft is interesting because it's used to describe the devil. It's a form of manipulating. It's a form of using your own, you're not following the will of God, you're doing what you want to do. Okay, That's what witchcraft is. Okay, and it's described first as a spiritual reality with the occultism, and it's also described as the power of the flesh. So it's, you know. So, to humble yourself is, remember where it says God gives grace to the humble? So, the Bible's trying to get you to the point where you, your focus of relationship is to turn to Him instead of assuming things. Okay? I ask the Lord what He thinks. I turn to Him. What's your thought about this, Lord? How many of you have asked God to do certain things in your life and He doesn't? And it frustrates you because you have to wait on the Lord. Are you guys like I am? I've been trained in America, man. I, if I don't get it now, I'm upset with the world. And yet the Bible is trying to say, hey, learn to be at peace. And one of the first places you have to be at peace is with you. You have to learn to trust the Lord when sometimes you can't make sense out of anything. Because you know he's good. And he's for you. And so this, this protects you. Why does this now... Why do you think humbling yourself, based on what I just talked to you about, protects you? Why do you think that protects you? You don't think you can do it in your own ability? That's one thing. What happens when you, you go outside of what God wants you to do and you do stuff in your own will? What usually is the result of that? Chaos. Chaos. Failure. Failure. Destruction. <laughs> it usually yeah, okay, so you guys got it. So it usually doesn't turn out the way you think it's going to turn out, all right? So a way to protect yourself. Uh, I find this fascinating. Do you remember in Mark chapter 11, verse 28, Jesus stood in front of all humanity and says, Now come unto me, all that are weary and heavy laden. I will give you rest. Take my yoke and learn of me. So I, I'm gentle of spirit and humble of heart. Do you remember when he went over that whole discourse? That all that stuff he's saying to him is the lifestyle of walking with me is rest. Mm -hmm. So if you're not at rest, you need to ask, what is, am, why am I getting out of the place of being humble and demanding things to work a certain way? And let's say that you're committed to the Lord in a lot of areas. Let's see if you guys are like me. I'm sold out on Jesus. I'll do whatever he says. I've committed my life to this stuff. But then I get frustrated with him not moving fast enough. Like, seriously, how, why do I have to pray 10 years over this thing? You guys like that? Yeah. You can actually be righteous and then enter into the same mess. You, you have to learn to just, okay, I present this to you, Lord. I trust your goodness, but I'm going to leave it in your hands, and I'm going to live a life of peace. All right, let's keep moving on. Oh, ooh, this is fun. Number three, the way you protect yourself is you confess. Any known sin. It's kind of interesting to say this. You don't confess all the sins you've ever done and then all the sins you think you might have done. You confess known sins. It's interesting to me. Isn't this amazing? Now think about this with me. We were just talking about salvation. When God considers you righteous, right? The Bible talks about you've been given the righteousness of God. What, is, what does that mean? That means that <clears throat> in eternity, think about this. Every one of us gets to stand before the judgment seat of God. Every one of us. All right? So everyone that's born gets this adventure. You get it, I get it, everyone we know, whether they realize it or not, they get to stand before the Lord on his judgment seat, and he gets to render a verdict over us. Isn't that fun? Now, because of that, when you got saved, now think about this, you're in time, right? So in time, here's, if I could 
I don't know if this is going to be a good illustration of it, but kind of here's the idea of the judgment seat of God. Here it's waiting for you. Oh no, I've got to face this thing. And God's sitting on his throne, right? You don't have to do this. You, you can't have your mom go do it for you. You can't get out of it. You can't make your pastor do this for you. Everyone gets to stand before this. And you have to give an account for your life. Every one of us. So, this is waiting for you. When is this going to happen to you? When you're no longer on this earth. Okay, when is this going to happen to you? When, when I die. Okay, when is this going to happen to you? <laughs> I thought those answers sounded good. <laughs> so you agree with all of them? <laughs> yeah. Okay, when, when's this event going to happen for you? The day of the Lord. Okay. <laughs> Maybe it's already happened. Okay. So, now think about this. How many of you had this experience? Someone said, hey, let's go to church, and for some odd reason, you thought that was a good idea. So you went there, and you're like, what am I doing here? And, and then you, you, you're having this internal dialogue with you, like, I think church is silly, so what am I doing here? And then they're saying a bunch of stuff to you, like, hey, you need to accept Jesus. And all of a sudden, this thing goes through your heart, and you're like, I don't know why, but I, I'd never do this, but that sounds like a great idea. And you go forward and you start blubbering on the ground and someone says, now I know you don't know anything of what you're saying, but just say this after me. And you say this, oh, oh, oh God, I've said, forgive me, I've ah, give me eternal life. And you get up and they tell you a bunch of stuff you don't even believe. You're saved! <laughs> right? <laughs> Alright? Then all of a sudden it's like, wow, I feel so different. What is that? And then they keep telling you, you're saved! Yeah, okay. <laughs> and then it kind of, oh, I'm actually saved. All right. Remember that experience? If that's how it happened for you? <laughs> what are you saved from? This. Jesus, our advocate. When, however you described it, that whole thing that he called you by name, hey, Ben, come over here. I want to introduce myself to you. He was bringing you into a courtroom. And Jesus was standing before his father, and he said, he's guilty, but I've called him to be mine. And so I'm going to take his punishment on myself, and I want you to give him my righteousness so that this never brought up again. This event happened the day Jesus saved you. Do you still don't have to ever do it again? It's over. The courtroom is that God stood before you, and he said, not guilty. That's an eternal judgment. That's not a temporal judgment. That's an... You've stood before the judgment of God. He's made a decision over eternity in his relationship with you. And he says, you're mine. I'm never going to hold this against you again. You've got your judgment seat. Yes? I didn't know that was what you were talking about. Mm. By how you worded it, I thought we had to give an account or we had to explain, you know. Our you did. Life. You did. So Jesus went and did it for you. Okay. He called you and said, Lee, I want you to be mine. And what he did is he stood up and he said, okay, now, Lord, I'm going to represent Lee's sins before you. And here's the sins she's done up to this point, but the sins in the future she knows nothing about, I know about them. So I'm going to take the penalty of all of them right now. And God said, great, she's forgiven. And when he did that and you received the Holy Spirit, God said, Lee, from this point on, I'm never going to judge you again. You're mine. Combination, all of everything you've done, I know all of your events, past, present, and future, I've determined that Jesus has paid the price for him. I'll never talk to you about this again. That's why there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Wow. And by the way, I'm just telling you basic salvation again. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. So, <clears throat> so obviously we're to repent. Mm -hmm. So now, why, now let's get back to confessing your sins. Here's the Lord's prayers. So if God has done that, why do you have to ever talk to him about your sins ever again? Well, Jesus talked to the disciples and he said, now look, he's telling Peter, he's telling, now I want to wash your feet. He says, you, no, you're not going to wash my feet. And he says, yeah, I want to, you know, you're being cleansed, but I need to wash your feet. No, and he says, if you won't let me wash my feet, you can't be a part of me. Do you guys remember that whole thing? What? Well, it's like, well, we don't do feet washing in the church. Is that not a big deal or something? He's, he's teaching an outward symbolic thing. I mean, eternal reality. You're going along in life, the confession of sin is not for you to get saved, it's for the enemy not to get a foothold in your life. 
You're being cleansed daily. It's for your benefit. This is to protect you. Doesn't, it, it's not about you going to heaven or not going to heaven. That whole theology out there, you may make sure you confess every one of your sins before you die. That's a wrong understanding of salvation. You've already been forgiven. This is for your benefit. You guys get it? Sin does work, uh, work on your soul. You want to be cleansed of it. So, <clears throat> we don't believe in this in the Protestant movement, which is kind of funny. Now, I don't need a priest to absolve me, but I do need people to confess. I mean, either I need to confess to the Lord, or I need to just share it with my brothers and sisters. That's why we do that kind of stuff. It's good to be a person that confesses. Isn't there some scripture somewhere that talks about standing in the judgment for the judgment the or something, something? Yeah, but that the judgment of a Christian is not the same thing as judgment. So non-Christians will stand there. No, all, all of us have. You already have done it. The, now you're going to stand before Christ and he's going to commend things on you for your service to him. Okay. Oh yeah, they still have this. This is waiting for him. But you're not going to go to the. the so he's not going to go. Now I've judged Hitler and Stalin and Pal Pot and all those guys. I've already judged them. Now all the Christians get up here. It's your turn. That's not going to happen. But what about all the make believers? The what? The make believers. I mean, I was. A, I thought I was a Christian for the first 29 years of my life. I went to a church. Never heard the gospel, never was preached, never used the Bible. And then when I first heard it, it was like a light bulb came on. And I, I was shocked that I had never heard the gospel. You weren't saved. And I, huh? You weren't saved. I wasn't saved right. until that day. Right. So there's still a lot of people sitting in pews going to churches as make believers. Make believers, I've never heard that term before. <laughs> people not saved, yeah, I agree. Yeah. So yeah. So that's why I, I just am adamant about people actually recognizing, because just going to church doesn't say. Right, right, right. So uh, you guys, we've gone a lot. I'm doing it again. I don't mean to go all over the place. Do you guys get it? This is for your benefit. This protects you. By the way, how does the enemy get, how does the enemy do the things he does in your life? By you not getting, it's like, sin is like collecting garbage where demons roll around in. So you want to make sure there's nothing in you for them to snag on to. That's why when he taught the Lord's Prayer, remember when he taught the Lord's Prayer, he said do this daily. So you don't accumulate a bunch of wicked things you've done, and then at the end of the year, I think I'll finally confess them. <laughs> you do it daily. That's why he taught the Lord's Prayer, as he said, do this daily. Uh, it, and so think how wise Jesus was. He wanted you to not have the enemy have access to you and on a daily basis he wanted you go, to go through a cleansing process so that there would be nothing in you. I, I think that's very kind. Yeah. Is oh. that actually in repentance asking him to forgive you? I'm sorry? Um, when you're going through your repentance and whatever you say, whatever verbiage is, is part of that asking him to forgive you because He's already forgiven us. So. It's for your benefit so the enemy can't accuse you or use that against you to do stuff in your life. God to forgive you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we have confession. It just brings up a scripture, forgive me, I don't know where it is, but it's something about Satan standing before the Lord. Accusing, accusing you day and night. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Is that like a legal courtroom setting? Well, it is. A, it, he's, yeah. And it is, it is Christ advocating for us at that time, or do we need to? Well, so where, the way I would look at it is this is what the enemy's doing all the time anyways. He's accusing you. Mm -hmm. Is God listening to it? Well, I don't think so because you've already been pronounced forgiven, but he wants to accuse you to God so that he can go and do destruction in your life. They don't follow you, so I have access to him. That's what he's basically trying to do. Um, so confession is the next one. Do you guys realize that confession and repentance are two different things? Confession is uh, telling, agreeing what God has shown you. Repenting is what? When the Lord shows you something. Okay, so repentance in the Greek New Testament has two different meanings. We always, in the American, we always 
give the second meaning, which I find fascinating, and we never teach the first meaning. The first word that's used for repentance means to let the light in. The second part of repentance is once the lights come in, I turn. So I can't turn unless the light comes in. Why? Why can't I turn from something wicked in my life until the light comes in? Can't see the right way to go. Can't see the right way to go. You don't what know do you? You don't. I'm sorry. You don't know you're doing it. You don't know you're doing it. Okay, so I want you guys to see this. I did confession first, so you already know you've done something. But that's different than repentance. That's why I told you the concept of letting the light in first and then turning. Why do you need to let the light in first, John? That's right. So you, you do not have the ability to heal or deliver yourself of anything just because you know it. Okay? That's spiritual reality. So someone has offended me. My heart is, I'll just use this as an example. I'm, un, I, I'm unforgiving. The Lord says, Brian, you're unforgiving. I say, God, forgive me of that. And then... I let the power of his presence come to why, where I still have pain associated with that and where I feel like even though I've said I've forgiven him, I actually still want to hit him in the head. God has to heal me. That's the idea of letting the light come in. He restores you so that you don't go back into being unforgiving. Does that make sense? This is the power of God to actually set you free from sins, <coughs> emotionally, spiritually, or physically. This is really important, and a lot of people don't know this step, and so, gosh, I keep forgiving that per I've forgiven him about a hundred times, but I still want to hit him in the head. You haven't gone through the word of repentance yet. Christ has the ability to heal your heart, get you past the sting and the effect of that, however it's affected you physically, spiritually, or emotionally, and not only give light, it's the light so that you can come out of it, and it's not struggling with you anymore. You do not have the ability to deliver yourself of darkness. Christ does have the ability to deliver you. So you have to wait and let him deliver you. Does that make sense? In 1 John, it says, um, <laughs> if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and purify us of all unrighteousness. Those are steps. I confess my sin, I wait before him, and I say, now cleanse me and heal me past this. And I wait as he does this. Have any of you ever done, uh, not sozo, well, yeah, sozo, inner healing stuff, or theophostic, or have ever gone and seen a counselor? Okay, so you sit, think about this. We don't, we, you can learn to do this on your own, but we always think, well, I don't know how to do this, so I'm going to tell you. You go to a counselor and you say, okay. I don't want to admit this, but I'm like this, and I do these kind of things. And you think, well, I brought it to the light. And you have. You brought it to the light, but you're not delivered from it yet. So when you bring it to the light, all of a sudden, here it is in the presence of Jesus. The counselor doesn't go, now, don't you feel better? He says, hey, let's let the Lord minister to you now. And he, and he asks the Holy Spirit, now, go into that place in their heart where they've received that lie and where it has a stronghold inside of them, and heal them and deliver them past this so that there's, they can't go back into it and think it's okay to live in that anymore. That's how you get delivered from stuff. It's not just by confessing it. I know a bunch of people that confess it, and they're, they're like, but I can't get set free. I confess it and confess it and confess it. Well, it, that's great, but you don't have the ability to deliver yourself. Christ is the only one who can deliver you, so you wait and let him come and do the work of cleansing you of all unrighteousness. Yeah, go ahead. So, uh, can I ask you a question about uh, when uh, John was confronting the Pharisees when he was baptizing them, and he said, who, who warned you through the viper, and, and he was you know, coming against the Pharisees. Uh, and he says, uh, he and he's talking about repentance, and he says, so produce fruit that is consistent with repentance. Mm -hmm. And so what was he saying that is that uh, it, your life shouldn't be uh, just as it has been. It should be actually reflecting some t sort of, of righteousness that is... Uh, 
So he's, he's beginning to, I think, uh, here's how I'll try to track with you. So we know from the Old Testament, the Torah, that we have God describing how to live, all right? Absent of the presence of the Holy Spirit. So we have what we would call steps or paths of righteousness throughout the Old Testament. So when John is saying, hey, you guys, you know, you came and you got baptized, produce fruit that shows you've repented, he's saying, just stop doing the stuff you already know that are evil. You know these things, are, the Torah has instructed you that's evil. Stop doing that. It has nothing to do with this principle because in the New Testament, Jesus is now getting them out of the law. The law is still necessary to point us in, but he's saying, I have something, this is a better covenant because not only am I going to get you free from the law, you're going to actually be able to live righteously. Does that help? Yeah. <clears throat> um, all right, last one, and then we'll pick up next month. Uh, keep going. So the, we have repent, and then this is fun. This is uh, kind of interesting. This is the one that um, I find that I struggle with, not because I want to. I find that a lot of people I talk to, they struggle with this. It's kind of saying you're going to, uh, it's going to amaze you how simple it is, but how difficult it is for humanity to do this, and yet it's one of the main ways to protect yourself. Okay, ready? Four, give all people. Okay, so here's a really weird concept if you didn't know this. You're on a fallen planet with people sinning all the time. Don't even look at yourself. Just, just look at the world you live in. People are sinning all the time. It's going to affect you. Their sins are going to affect you. Okay, so Jesus, now, now here's what Jesus says. So hold a grudge and spend your whole entire life trying to get back at them. <laughs> oh, he didn't say that. I'm sorry. That must be Karl Marx's book then. <laughs> Forgive all people. Okay, so this is to protect yourself, so let's go after it. Why does forgiveness protect you? Uh, I'll ask you way back there, since I, I keep looking at you but never asking you. So why does forgiveness protect you? And if you don't know, just say, I don't know. Okay, why does forgiveness protect you? God's forgiveness for us. So explain that. Well, as we forgive others, that opens the doors for God to forgive us. Okay. Why does forgiveness protect you? Probably because it doesn't let the enemy come in to any open doors. Okay. John, last, uh, if you're okay, I'll ask you last. Why does forgiveness protect you? Uh, Well, I, I, I think it's uh, the way in which God has a design for us to come into a place of uh, in a, a relationship that uh, he wants us to walk in fellowship. And if we aren't in that place of forgiveness, we don't have fellowship with him. Okay. I think you guys are all hitting it. I'm going to try to take all that you said and just kind of bring it into a thought here. Um, what, when you don't forgive, what are you keeping in your heart? Don't just say sin. Bitterness, anger, hate. So you were created in the image of God, so guess what? You weren't created to have those things in you. And when you don't forgive, you think about this, bottle it up inside of you and it becomes a corrosive agent to relationship and everything you put your hands to. It's like storing death inside of you and then going, why don't I? Because you've stored corrosive death inside of you, and it's eaten you. All right? So when you forgive, everyone thinks, well, the person sinned against me. I don't want to forgive them. But you have to look at it realistically. It's like, a, it's like drinking poison and trying to contain it. You were not created to be unforgiving. God forgives. You're created in his image. You're to be like him. That's the best way you function, is learning to forgive. There was a, um, if you've never read this guy's book, uh, I would encourage you, there was a guy named George Washington Carver. You guys ever heard of him? Mm -hmm. He's the guy that was that uh, slave 
that ended up becoming free. And then he went and taught at a, a black university. And he's the guy that figured out the thousand things to do with a peanut. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Uh -huh. So have any of you ever read his story? Mm -hmm. One of the things he found, you'll find this funny. He actually found out that the oil in peanut has healing properties to it. And he used to have students come by that had different conditions. And he'd rub peanut oil on them, and they would get over them get over their conditions. OK, so why? that's what he did with the peanut. So the guy started off as a slave, and he became this brilliant scientist. All right? and, and he went to the Senate to actually present it, but they still had segregation. So he had to go behind and be taken in to show all these senators all these brilliant se So, But here's the thing about him. He, he, he triumphed in so many areas of his life, but the main thing he triumphed in is forgiveness. He modeled forgiveness constantly. And he actually, now think about this. He believed that the, the exercise of all humanity, you become strong spiritually when you practice forgiveness every day. It's like lifting weights. If you want to become spiritually strong, you practice forgiveness every day. And then it becomes easier and easier and easier. And guess what? It's harder for the enemy to get a foothold on you when you're practicing forgiveness. It's like you build up this strength to letting fence never rest on you. You just let it bounce off. And all of a sudden, all the attacks of the enemy, just, he can't get a foot in you when you forgive. And this is why Jesus goes after it. And he's, he's always on everybody, but you've got to learn to forgive. You've got to forgive. Now think about this. He even teaches it in the Lord's Prayer. You have to forgive every day. He's telling you, protect yourself. Don't go get in it. Um, I say this, and I get the idea that no one believes me. I, I don't want to tell you all the stories of this, but I've been in ministry for, oh gosh, I'm getting old now, 27 years. I've been, uh, I've had ministers do offensive things to me. I've had Average Christian do offensive things to me in the name of Jesus. I, and every trip I go on, I'm not kidding. And you're going to, I don't know if you've, you actually practice forgiveness. I'm just trying to tell you. Inevitably, I'll go somewhere and I'll be myself being a functional Christian. And someone will say or do something offensive to me every trip I go on. And in the first couple of years I traveled, I kept telling Jesus, what is wrong with these people? <laughs> It's like, why are you sending me to minister to them? And then he started getting this across to me. He said, Brian, I didn't call you to, this doesn't sound amazing, I didn't call you to deal with righteous people. I called you to minister to my people. They're hurting. And hurting people hurt people. Right? They don't know how to do anything else. And so because of that, you can't take, if you realize people are hurting, you can't get offended with them anymore because you have to remember what Jesus has taken you through. He took you broken, and he said, well, I'm going to forgive you, and I'm going to love you and love, even though, you guys ready? You're not worthy of him doing this, but he, he's chosen you to be worthy of this. And so he takes all these broken people, and he just says, no, I forgive you. I forgive you. No, I'm going to love you. I'm going to love you. And you're going to have to learn to be like him. So, you guys, I, now people say offensive things to me, and I even have people point out to me, did you hear that offensive thing that person said to you? No. I'm letting it hit me and bounce off me. I, you have to choose not to get offended. It's a choice. If you want to become like Arnold Schwarzenegger inside your soul, lift the weights of forgiveness every day. Don't say, well, I'm going to forgive up to a certain point and I'm going to get bitter and angry about stuff. Your, your soul will find so much rest and so much joy if you practice forgiveness constantly. Do you know, do you remember when I drew the, when I was telling you the spiritual warfare thing and I drew the arrows up here and the arrows here? The enemy has determined to use evil and wickedness to steal your relationship with Jesus. Don't forget this passage. I just taught on it a couple months ago and then we're going to finish with this. Jesus said that as we get closer to the end, the increase of wickedness would cause the hearts of many to grow cold. Why do they grow cold? It, just because there's an increase of wickedness, because they stop forgiving. And they start getting offended. Mm -hmm. Hey guys, when you start an increase of wickedness, strengthen your muscle of forgiveness. Now I didn't say go make yourself to it. I said strengthen your heart to forgive. 
because you actually have the authority in this situation for yourself and even against what the enemy's doing. You have it. So don't, don't get taken out of the battle by, it's like, you guys ready? It's like me running into the battle and when I have unforgiveness, it's like taking the shield of faith and just throwing it up in the air and going, hit me! Because <laughs> that's what you're doing. You have to have yourself in place. You gird yourself with forgiveness and then when you move forward with the shield of faith against the enemy, it just bounces off you. You guys have a question or a comment? What did you mean when you said you don't submit to it? To what? You just said, I'm not telling you to submit to it. Uh, you don't go somewhere for people to be abusive to you or be unkind. And so I, I don't sign up and say, oh, that guy's abusive. I think I'll go hang out with him all day. Right. <laughs> but I don't let what he does. Oh, I'm just so offended. You guys get it? By the way, unless you go live in a monastery where you have a vow of science, silence, even Christians are going to do things that are going to irritate you. You have to choose not to get offended. But it's okay Especially not to just submit yourself to it. Well, no. Jesus didn't say, come unto me and let me make you the doormat of humanity. <laughs> so, you know this, right, Liz? Jesus actually rebuked people yeah. and said, stop doing that. That's not Jesus submitting to John. Okay. So, he didn't say, hey, sign up. It said, forgive him. And by the way, you can forgive them if you realize, oh, wait a minute, they're not starting that. That's coming from another source. Mm -hmm. Don't look at people ever as your, I don't care how wicked they are. Look past them and recognize Satan's behind this. And, I, and it'd be better for them to get saved than to go to hell for eternity just because I'm irritated with them. Would you guys agree to that? Okay. I hope so. And if you're not there, just be honest. Well, I'd rather take him out with a two-by-four and let Jesus work on you so you can forgive him. All right? And guys, I'm not perfect at this. Uh, periodically, I don't know if you guys ever go through this. Periodically, God has me over here doing the stuff of the kingdom. I'm preaching and ministering. I'm just, oh, man, the love of God, it's so great. And then Jesus takes me over here and says, now study all this wicked stuff because it'll help later on to deal with things better. And when I'm over here studying, like I'm now being uh, the I could tell he's saying, I want you to study Karl Marx. And I'm like, no. I mean, the guy was extremely wicked. I was telling Cliff, I've just started doing research on this guy. He worshiped Satan specifically and believed his life goal was anything that God created he needed to destroy. And he was an incredible racist. And his philosophy has killed over 110 million people since he's been on the planet. And now Jesus is going, now go over that. I want you to understand that worldview. Now, why would he make me go study? Because he wants me to take on what the enemy is doing to affect people that way. But when I get over there, I, I start looking at the people and I think, that guy needs to be hit in the head with a two by four. And I kind of forget where I'm at for a season. All right. Did you enjoy that moment into my psyche, Ben? It's kind of scary, wasn't it? <laughs> okay. You want to have a comment or a statement they need to make before we... Kind of moved to the next thing we're going to do. I have a couple of questions. Yeah, go for it. Uh, first, um, in all of this, in praying for others, it, obvious, it, it seems obvious to me it does no good to pray for God to forgive their sins because we don't know their actual sins. Well, you have been given a priestly function as a believer where it says that if they confess your sins, you're allowed to say you're forgiven. Right. The other thing, is, I don't think you could just indiscriminately do that. It's like you have, you've never confessed your sins to the Lord. Oh, you're just forgiven. Well, that's not going to work. Yeah. And uh, secondly, in all of this, we're in a war. Mm -hmm. There are many on both sides. Do numbers matter? No. No. It's so, we, so, so our prayer against the enemy is effective oh yeah at that moment at that time what causes it to come back okay so i'm gonna to have to ask you what you mean come back but luke 10 17 describe it's a position of authority and it's jesus talking to the disciples so he sends out not the 12 but the 70 he says now go out and they come back in luke chapter 10 and they're rejoicing because even the demons were submitted to him which i i don't know 
I guess they've never experienced that. And they're like, wow, demons even submit to it. And he said, well, I've given you all authority over serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Okay, so that means if you know Jesus, you have authority over demons. And he described them with symbolic terms. So serpents and scorpions are different levels of demonic spirits. And then he says, over all the power of the enemy. So the enemy has no authority over you either. So he just said, here's the authority structure, and here's how you are in the authority structure. He has no authority over you. He didn't say he has no authority over you if you have 10 of you together. He was talking to them, and he says he has no authority over you. And he was talking to individuals. And then he, and then he starts teaching on authority. Have you ever studied authority by chance? Uh, so Jesus comes to the disciples and he says, now look, I've given you the keys of the kingdom. Okay, now what kingdom is in control of everything right now? The kingdom of God. So when he says, I gave you the keys, he didn't say, I'm going to do it. He said, I've given it to you. And so you bind and you lose. That's your job. And wow, that's a lot of authority. There are some teachings, and I don't know, maybe this is what you're referring to about in Numbers, mm -hmm. that's saying you don't go after territorial spirits, you don't do that alone, you have to do that with other people. Yeah, I've heard that. Who teaches that? Bethel even. Oh, I need to go tackle him in Bethel. All right, so <laughs> your authority is based on the person you know. Okay, so the right way of saying this is this, don't do anything he doesn't tell you to do. But if he tells you to do it, you have all the authority you need. Now, you ready? Uh, are you really a, so the average demon you don't have any fear over, but when you get over some, a demon that's harassing the state of Colorado, you think, oh, I better not say anything to him. What, where, why do you have no fear over garden variety pain in the neck demons? <laughs> because there's those teachings that say, oh. Okay, so I want you to think about it. That's why the Bible used the heavenly and the earthly. How do you know what you're dealing with? You have to see it on the earthly realm. So the Bible is going to describe the heavenly realm. If I'm trying to drive out a demon, I don't know his standing in the kingdom of darkness, but I know I have authority over him. I have authority over him. Over Ben? No, not, no the demon. I'm using Ben. He doesn't even have a demon. I'm saying if Ben had a demon. I, I don't know his structure in the kingdom of darkness. I just know I have authority over him. Well, what if that's Satan himself working through Ben? And I just say, come out of him. Do I have authority to do that? Yes. Why do you believe that? You just said, I'm afraid to take on territorial stuff. But I just told you I drove out Satan himself out of Ben, and you're like, not have a problem with that. Why is that? <laughs> it sounds about right, but it's not what Scripture teaches. So your, your authority is, What's proper authority in the kingdom of God? You're under authority. So you do what Jesus leads you to do. So the first place you understand your authority is what is the written word said on this subject. I just told you what the written word said about it. So even if you don't have Jesus giving you a revelation, you're under this authority. In a specific situation, you don't just do ministry based on what you think is good at modeling. You get before the Lord and go, how do you want me to drive this out of bed? And the Lord tells you, well, you're under proper authority when you do that. <laughs> That's the door. That's fun. The territorial. Yeah, there you go. And I, no, um, just so you know, I've heard that teaching too, but I, but I have to say something. I see what they're trying to do, but I want to give a corrective thing. If it violates what Scripture says, I don't care how many revelations a person gets or how well they do word of knowledge ministry, they are wrong because it comes predicts God's eternal word that he's given every generation. And people get, in the charismatic world, they get confused about this. You can have a charismatic teacher say something that's actually not biblical, but because they move in the power of God, you assume they're right. But if it contradicts even basic teaching, they're wrong. They're wrong. And that's hard. For, it's like, but how can they be wrong? Because they don't think good. They just know how to move in the power of God. Um, so fun to talk about this. All right, let's pray. All right, Lord, we're in the process of doing this. Now, this is almost like a boot camp. So we ask that you would train us properly on how to do this. These things that we covered allow us to become people that know that we're protected. Let humility be our standard. Let us repent and confess and be at peace. 
I command the blessing of the Lord upon you right now. In the name of Jesus, amen. Thank you.